welcome to the foundation section. We'll begin with uh, David Trio talking about quantum supremacy in mechanical tasks. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you all to all the organizers for this wonderful conference and all of you for coming, of course. So this is a joint work with uh, Tim Le and Miguel Navasquez, and it was recently published in MPJ Quantum Information. Uh, but I want to start with a disclaimer. If you don't want to have a, ho a horrible time, don't send anything here. It's, uh, I, I, it's not a predatory journal, but it, it's almost one. Like they clearly took the template from a biology journal and copy pasted it and did no change to accommodate quantum information people, even though it's a journal only about quantum information, and they do not copy, no copy editing. And I'm telling you this because I wish someone had told me before I submitted anything there. And maybe at the end of the talk, you can tell me if this work fits more in life sciences, behavioral and social sciences, or ecological, evolutionary, environmental sciences. This is one of the million of forms that I had to fill after acceptance of the paper. But okay, let's talk about uh, uh, happy stuff now. So quantum supremacy mechanical tasks. In this conference, we've seen a lot of quantum advantages and stuff for like communication tasks, computational tasks. But here I want to focus on something more basic, perhaps something more uh, that was already in the beginning of quantum physics. And mechanical tasks are about things moving in real space. And before I talk about projectiles, and if I have time, rockets, and quantum backflow, I would like to maybe show some examples of mechanical tasks that I think a lot of, all, all of you should know, or at least I, because I like them a lot. So one could arguably say that the first mechanical task is, uh, well, there's a quantum advantage, is quantum tunneling. It's very difficult to, to, to put a date to the discovery of quantum tunneling because it seems that in, in, the, in that time everyone was vaguely aware of it, but it was published for the first time in this, in the first of a trilogy of papers where the Hund realized that, okay, when you solve the Schrodinger equation with some potential, the solution has, some of the solutions, all of the eigenfunctions, have a positive probability in being some, in some region that is not allowed classically. Uh, of course, this is an example of a quantum advantage. Another task that is mechanical and where there's an advantage is the one called quantum backflow. This, is, uh, this could be taught also in a quantum physics one course, but somehow no one seems to be very aware of it. It was discovered also in a trilogy of papers, but this time in the one appendix of the last paper. In this paper, Alcock wanted to, to it was studying the problem of the time of arrival in quantum mechanics, which is like when you have a particle moving in one dimension, when can we say that it has arrived somewhere? And he saw that there's a problem because uh, if you have like a, part, a quantum particle that only has positive components of the momentum, it can still flow backwards. As he says somewhere, it's like the, the probability current can be appreciably negative for an appreciably part of the total time interval, even though psi itself is traveling wholly in the positive direction. How this happens? Uh, is something like this. You have uh, such a wave function. It is overall moving to the right, but somehow the probability of finding the particle to the left of the, uh, of the real axis increases ever so slightly uh, as it's moving so that the overall effect is that there's a probability flow to the left. Even though, again, the components of the momentum of such a particle are all positive. So this uh, was uh, isolated by Bracken and Meloy in this paper in 1994, and they defined this constant, which uh, gives a, a numerical estimate of how big this, is, uh, this effect is. So the quantity of interest, he, of interest here is the integrated probability flow at the origin, and we want it to be to the left, so there's a minus sign to account for that. Uh, and we take the supremum of this quantity over all possible integration times, or over all particles with a positive momentum distribution. This turns out to be, according to some numerical estimations, around 0.04. So this is a very small effect, but it is possible to have. Uh, this will be important later for us as well. Uh, and this is really cool and essentially unknown in the wider community for some reason. And another effect I really like is uh, what I call Cyrilson's other problem. I know if you're familiar with Cyrilson's problem in non-local games. But he also thought about this uh, very cute problem in which you have a harmonic oscillator. And what you want is you, you measure at three times. 
at the begin at the at zero time at after one third of the period of the harmonic oscillator and after two thirds of the period of the harmonic oscillator. And what you want to know is what's the probability of finding the harmonic oscillator in the positive real axis. So what's the probability that the position is positive? So a classical particle, the, here I'm drawing phase space for position and momentum, if it starts in this region of phase space, the probability is one third because you're measuring with one third probability at the beginning, which is positive, and after one third of the period where the particle will be here, here and therefore not positive, and after two thirds of the period where the particle will be here and also not positive. And so you can divide phase space into regions where the probability is one third or two thirds so in general, uh, that, that's if you start with a deterministic point. In general, if you have a harmonic oscillator in some ensemble of position, or in some ensemble on phase space, you could get some probability between one third and two thirds. However, in quantum mechanics, this probability is given by the average value of this operator. This is the, the uh, step function. So it's one when x is positive and zero otherwise. And here is just the evolution under, well, the Hamiltonian is the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. Uh, again, uh, T is the period of the, of the particle. And because these three operators do not commute, uh, you cannot just take the spectrum to be like the sum of the spectrums or whatever. And you can see that there's like, uh, for, some part, for some initial state, you can get a probability bigger than two thirds. So this is also uh, a quantum effect. And after uh, a long, long calculation, he managed to prove that this is strictly less than one but he wasn't able to manage to get more information about the, 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 the advantage that you have when you have a harmonic oscillator for this problem. And these problems are not just mm, mental masturbation. You can also do interesting things with them. So uh, this Sidelson's other problem was picked out by the group of Valerius Karani in Singapore, and they did lots of things with it. They developed new entanglement witnesses for like different types of entanglement in, in continuous variable, of course. Uh, based with uh, all of these, uh, there are some dynamic based entanglement witness, also some quantumness uh, uh, detection protocols. So it can be useful. But okay, so uh, we introduced in this work a new, pro uh, well, we'll study a different problem. Uh, we're interested in the transport of matter across the real space. So our problem is this, and don't be fooled, this is just a drawing, we don't have gravity or anything. Uh, we assume that we have a particle in a one dimensional line and it starts confined in some region between zero and L. And what we want to know is what's the probability after some time has elapsed of detecting the particle in some other region, like usually we take the semi-infinite interval between A and infinity. So classically, uh, what's the best thing? So if we have a particle, uh, let us, um, uh, the, the best thing classically that we can do is put the particle here at the rightmost point and hope that it has enough momentum to get there in the time that we have. So we have, we have a, a, a probability distribution for the momentum. The, the classical probability is uh, this. Uh, so we're going to compare a classical particle confined there with a quantum particle confined there that have both the same momentum distribution. Okay, that, that's the task that we're looking at. So what's, uh, we want to optimize the probability of seeing this particle here. So the classical probability, as I said, it corresponds to this quantity, is the, the, the probability that the momentum is bigger than what it needs to get there. And because it's the same as the quantum particle, we can rewrite it as such an integral. And the quantum probability, well, is given by the operator of, this is the measurement operator of seeing the particle in a position bigger than A. And this is, we, we evolve the particle, of course, for time t under the, the free Hamiltonian, so p squared over 2n. So we can, so the quantity we're interested in is, of course, the supremum over all particles that start confined in this interval of the difference. If this is positive, this means that there is uh, a way that you can prepare a quantum particle so that you can detect it here more likely than a classical particle with the same distribution of momentum. And this is what we call a quantum projectile. Okay. And to study this, well, uh, bear with me for a second. This looks more complicated than it is. Here I'm rewriting that. And we can precisely write what these operators, the evolution of these operators after some time delta t, this corresponds to this, and this integral corresponds to this operator. So, okay, so the problem now to get to understand the, this value is to understand the spectrum of this operator. Uh, and this, as we saw with uh, Chilson's other problem, it can be quite complicated. However, uh, what we do is, okay, instead of looking at the standard uh, 
uh, quantum mechanics, we're going to use the phase space quantum mechanics. So we introduce the Wigner quasi probability distribution, and we see that the average value of this operator is just an integral of over over the, the phase space, where we ponderate this operator with the Wigner function. So it, it, we can draw it something like this. We have the state in green. This is confined between zero and one. I choose L1 here to, to be able to make a drawing. And if you compute this function on phase space, you get these two wedges, one with, uh, with a coefficient plus one and one with a coefficient minus one. So really what we're optimizing is the integral over this wedge uh, of uh, a state that is confined in this region. And because this has a negative uh, coefficient, what we want is the bottom part of the spectrum of this operator. But it turns out that uh, using some symmetry stuff, so there's a metaplectic, metaplectic group, if you know it, acts on the phase space and preserves uh, all of these quantities. So we can uh, change this uh, integral to some uh, standard integral over phase space and study that then. So for example, here I have a, an example. If you change the operators X and P to some other operators, the important thing is that the commutator is preserved then the, the result of this optimization problem that I'm doing here will be the same. So we do this. And we can also, okay, so this, the term, this sends also our state to some other state in a different region. And this shows we can always do such a transformation to some state so that the, the, the quantity that we're interested in, the quantum advantage, only depends on this combination of the parameters, the mass of the particle, the size of the region where it was confined, and the time that we were waiting. And then with this, uh, we can also, while well, playing with this, you can get some other operators. So for example, this one here corresponds, if you, if you undo the, the, fa the phase space quantum mechanics uh, stuff, this corresponds to the quantum backflow uh, quantum advantage. So the supremum of all over all states that are confined in this region of integrating this wedge gives you exactly the bracken Miller constant that I took at the beginning. So uh, solving this problem, we also get new information about the bracken Miller constant, which was, uh, which were, okay, the, there are some, there were some lower bounds, but they're not very good. Um, and yes, and of course this is when we do the limit of alpha going to infinity, when we get all the, that region. But yeah, so we first, okay, so we do two things with this. We compute lower and upper bounds to try to get an estimate of how big this effect is. And with this, we also get new information about the bracken Miller constant. So for the lower bounds, because we have a compact operator for finite alpha, we can approximate it with uh, uh, very well with uh, finite, finite dimensional operators. So we get exactly such a curve here. This is the blue curve. And this in black here, I put the, the, the conjecture value of the bracken Miller constant. So it seems to be getting there, but of course, uh, this doesn't tell us if it eventually go above or not. Upper bounds are equally important for this. And to get upper bounds, uh, what we do is we, we, we use an old paper by Werner. Werner in this paper studies, uh, without knowing that backflow exists, he gives bounds to the backflow effect uh, and even says that, uh, even though th this is before Bracken and Meloid. But anyway, what Werner does is he studies operators which correspond to integrating a region on phase space. He, he is interested in the spectrum of this. Again, because of the arrival time problem, he wants this to define like some coherent arrival time operators. And he thought it was very difficult. So Werner is able to produce such a spectrum. And what we have after, again, a metaplectic transformation is also such an operator where we integrate uh, over some wedge, but uh, we have a, a state that is confined to some other space. It's not, uh, it's, we're not interested in the operator acting over all the Hilbert space, but only uh, a, sub, a subspace. So Bernard gets a spectrum that goes between minus 0 0.515559 uh, by diagonalizing it. Uh, and one. Uh, but, so this already gives an upper bound to the bracken Miller constant because, here, again, here is a coefficient minus one, so the, the lower part is the important part. So this means that the bracken Miller constant is smaller than the absolute value of this number. But because we are, again, applying these operators to a subspace, it could be that the, the upper bound is even lower. I mean, th meaning this is just an upper bound and not the exact value because this is the exact value for, like, for approximately exact for this operator. 
but uh, not here. He, this just is an upper bound, so can we improve this? And the thing is, yes, we can do it, and it's because when we restrict to the subspace where the function is confined in this region, here it doesn't matter what kind of operator we have. We can integrate any, pa any part of uh, the Bigner function here, and it shouldn't change the value of the spectrum. So that is what we do. We are able to diagonalize operators of this form. This is a hyperbolic region of phase space. I have to say integrating uh, functions in phase space is very complicated. But yeah, the, using the fact that this region is invariant under, the, under squeezing, we can almost diagonalize it and then study the spectrum of this operator. And by taking some, uh, studying lots of different regions, we can give better and better upper bounds. So what we get is that the uh, bracket Muller constant is, has to be smaller than 0 0.08, while Berner's result was only 0 0.15. And this is, this is important because there are some people in the backflow community which are trying to go above the bracket Muller constant, find some effects that have a bigger quantum advantage. And Berner's bound is not good enough to prove that uh, these effects are better than the bracket Muller constant because the bracket Muller constant, in principle, before this work, we didn't know if it was one. Uh, but it's not. But with this bound, we can al already tell that the same effects are really beyond quantum backflow. Okay, and uh, we also try with our uh, uh, projectile to get to go beyond the bracket Muller constant, and we try different things. Uh, here is one cool thing that didn't work, but I still like showing it because uh, the picture is very nice. Uh, is okay. What if we concatenate? one projectile and then another projectile. So it's a projectile that then loses a bit of mass and goes over the same thing. And it turns out that, uh, no, this doesn't give an advantage. It's still bounded by the bracket Miller constant. But if you change the problem a bit, if you, all, if you compare the quantum particle with uh, classical particles, not only that have the same momentum distribution, but also the same position distribution, then we can go beyond the bracket Miller constant to 0 0.1262. So the advantage is there. The problem is that, uh, uh, well, this problem I don't think has any operational meaning beyond, uh, okay, we got a better value because if both the position and the momentum are the same, I don't know, it's a bit weird. But yeah, so uh, we can go beyond. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. So thank you for your talk. Uh, at some point you were plotting, depending on some parameter, alpha, and uh, I forgot what alpha was, and I was interested in asking yeah. that to you. Yeah, alpha is the mass of the particle times the size of the initial confinement region squared divided by the time you wait until then. So we, we can we prove that the, the quantum advantage depends only on this parameter. So okay. it, it's not a function of the time, the mass, and it's just one, one parameter. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Hey, um, so this is a, a vague question, but you're talking about like the time that the particle takes to get from one region to another region. And I was just, just wondering if, you, if this has any connection with uh, like in quantum computation, when you're doing some sort of quantum walk and you want to search for, for, uh, for a, a marked element, for example, in your graph, and you have some quantum advantage for the quantum walker reaching one point of the graph to the other. So I don't know if this, if this advantage has any connection with that algorithmic kind of advantage for searching. Okay, so first, there's, uh, maybe I want to make a clarification about this, because we're not actually interested in a time of arrival. This is what has been, try to be done a lot of times, and every time you see that it makes not much sense. We, here we take a more operational approach, but we just wait some time and then measure to see if the particle is there. And we just look at the, if the probability is big or not. And regarding to your question with quantum walks, I don't know because, uh, so that's very interesting, but quantum walks always have something discrete, no? Either space or time, if I know, if I, well, I don't know if, yeah. So, I'm not sure about this, but uh, okay, this, this is the standard continuous time, continuous space, quantum mechanics where you get the thing. So uh, quantum walks are like 
a discrete version of the standard evolution. No? So there must be some connection, but uh, I don't know. Maybe, I guess if you, do a, if you do a limit of a quantum walk in a graph that is linear with a lot of nodes, you go a limit where they're infinitely close and the time is infinitely small, you, you should recover the Schrodinger evolution, no? Yeah, so uh, th th there must be a connection. Like the probability must also like tend to this. But uh, it's true I haven't looked into this. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh. Thank you for a nice talk. I was wondering if, if you, if not quantum walks, if you identified other possible applications, like like uh, the other results you pointed out for Sirison's problem, are there applications that you can envisage for for projectiles? Yeah. So there there might be. We don't know yet, but uh, we're trying. There might be some application of detecti detecting quantumness in in well continuous variable systems. So, uh, for example, all of this uh, well, I want to say quantum gravity, but there's all of these experiments where they confine a small particle, and you really want to see that it's behaving quantumly. Maybe there's some application out there, and we're working with the Aspelmeyer group in Vienna to find something like that. But right right now, we don't have anything yet. Thanks. Uh, so this is in 1D. So would the results also apply to if you consider the situation in 2D, or could the, there be any differences? Mm, well, indeed, this is in 1D, and I didn't look at 2D at all. Uh, but I know that the quantum backflow people have looked at 2D, and there is also quantum backflow. So okay. I, I assume that whenever there's quantum backflow, this effect can also happen because they are equivalent and there are chains of coordinates in phase space. But yeah, this. Is, this is something to look at, of course. But, uh, yeah, the quantum backflow people have looked at a million equations in a million situations. Uh, there's, there's always backflow. It's amazing. Backflow actually is not even a quantum effect. In the classical electromagnetism, you also have that backflow. It's a wave phenomenon. And the surprising part is that also the surprising part is because you have a particle moving. Away. If you think of a particle, it's moving backwards somehow. But, but yeah, the backflow is ubiquitous almost. This is quite interesting. So this must also be because it's the same thing. So just a curiosity, uh, can you, have you analyzed or looked at this problem from the point of view of Bohmian mechanics to see what's going on at the level of hidden variables? Uh, no, we haven't, no. Uh, you, do you think it's worthwhile? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the problem, I mean, the problem is that, well, I, I am aware that Bohmian mechanics is uh, quite difficult to compute stuff with. But, and, but here, even without Bohmian mechanics, this is already quite difficult. Like this is one of the, the this in phase space is one of these, uh, this is the, the Bigner function of a, of a wave function that has quite a big advantage, like 0 0.03 or something. And you see it's already very complicated. I, I cannot fathom doing a <laughs> Bohmian computation with this starting point. But maybe, maybe numerically we can see something. But it's already difficult to understand at the level like this is an approximation we, we just truncated Hilbert space after some 1,700 number basis operators, and we optimize that to see the you get quite complicated stuff already. So I don't know. Without knowing exactly what's going on, it's quite difficult. But maybe, maybe. All right, then uh, let's thank the speaker.